my name is Maria Ma. I'm the application scientist and the market development manager at Redshift Bio. So I joined Redshift Bio because I love new and exciting things. And I really feel this MS technology is one of those that could lead us into the future. So today I'm super excited to introduce you all to MMS. So first of all, uh, what is MMS? Uh, what does it do? MMS, which uh, stands for microfluidic modulation spectroscopy, it measures previously undetectable structure changes. So as we all know, structure determines uh, function affects stability and dry segregation. So controlling structure is the key to ensure the best quality of our product. Speaking of uh, structure, in the case of protein, we cannot avoid talking about the four levels, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. So while today's technology makes it easy to quantify the primary and the quaternary bimerian size, it's really the needle, uh, the secondary and tertiary, that's not easy. And um, as far as I know, that is the reason why many labs skip um, the secondary and tertiary, because mm, technologies for secondary and tertiary structure are usually too unreliable and or too labor intensive to be useful across all formulation ranges. So the question is, can we skip it? Um, just imagine that you made sure the primary amino acid sequence uh, are the same, and then you have, for example, all monomers with minimal size changes. Does it mean you still have the optimized structure in the formulation, or do you uh, even have a way to optimize the structure? Uh, so this is the gap MMS is filling in. And because this is such an important gap to be filled, MMS has been quickly adopted over the past three to four years by big pharmas and major CDMOs. So speaking of our uh, customers, why do they use MMS? Why does MMS worth it? So from the structural perspective, MMS quantifies the stability, aggregation, similarity, and has many more innovative uh, applications mm, with all kinds of biomolecules. So there are four features that really makes MMS stand out. The first one is that it measures a huge dynamic range of concentration from 0 0.0 to over 200 mix per mil. And second, uh, it allows you to measure your molecules in the formulation of interests, uh, including complicated formulations, no need for dilutions. And number three, full automation from uh, measurement to analysis. And number four, it's up to 30 times more sensitive than traditional comparable technologies like FTRR or CD. So how does MMS achieve so? Uh, let's take a deeper look into it. First, at the heart of MMS is the high power quantum cascade laser, which is 1000 times brighter than a traditional FTIR glow bar. And number two is our high precision microfluidic flow cell, which enables rapid real time sample buffer referencing. And number three, full automation, again, which not only saves time, but also uh, minimizes the human error. And number three, uh, our all-in-one user-friendly software. I normally don't bother mentioning the software, but I find more and more customers coming to us because of the software. It's fully automated from, um, you can control it from measurement to maintenance, to analysis. It exports high quality figures for publications and customizable uh, reports. Um, so by rapidly alternating the sample and buffer through the flow path where the laser shines on, the differential absorbance unit or the signal of the sample minus the signal of the buffer is recorded at each wave number across the whole AMAP1 band of the IR spectrum, which probes uh, the backbone uh, conformation of a biomolecule and then interpolate it into a spectrum. Let me just introduce the, the hardware. This one is what we call the analyzing unit, and this one is what we call electronic unit. 
the electronic unit houses uh, the CPU, the liquid coolant, the peristaltic pump, and the vacuum pump. The vacuum pump uh, offers um, a really convenient way for you to degas the sample. You may not notice, uh, you thought like this is a decoration, which is what I thought when I first saw it, but it's actually a secret chamber. If you lift uh, the lid here, uh, it allows you to put uh, your plate inside and then you can close it up and enable the degassing procedure inside the software. Um, yeah, so how about let's move uh, to the analyzing uh, unit and uh, zoom to the lower part first. So the lower part has our um, sample loading area and um, the, the sample injector needle, two needles, because uh, for this technology, everything needs to be in pair uh, for the buffer sample real-time referencing. And on the needles, there are many smart sensors to detect um, like air bubbles, liquid uh, levels, um, and calculate the flow rate. Uh, beneath the needle is a needle wash station. So in the optical bench, we have the quantum cascade laser somewhere over here, and the detectors, uh, some mirrors, and the filter, and also the flow cell. If you lift uh, this, uh, it allows you to quickly and easily change the flow cell if you need to. Speaking of the flow cell, I have a spare one to show you uh, what it looks like. So you can see the Y shape. Yeah, you can see the Y shape here. And uh, it allows the alternation between uh, the sample and the buffer. And uh, yeah, so the sample and buffer will share the flow path. So the laser will shine this way. And so the, the flow path, the depth of the flow path in this direction uh, is usually 22 to 23 microns because each flow cell is manually made. Uh, this number is going to be unique. The system also includes a system water bottle, which is connected to a water station inside the analyzing unit. So this can be used for um, washing, cleansing, flushing, maintenance, uh, and also like health checks. Um, because we have uh, such a large bottle, you can do it remotely at home. Um, so there's a waste uh, bottle beneath the instrument. And we also have a um, sample fraction collector. Um, I would like to point out that MMS is a non-destructive technology. We actually have an app note showing that the molecules measured um, after MMS uh, and recollected in the sample fraction collector has no structural changes and is ready to be used uh, for the next thing. System is compatible uh, with 24 and 96 well plates. So with a 96 uh, well plate, the maximum amount of sample you can measure is 40 seven and it usually takes overnight you never go beyond one day so at least you can measure a full plate per day um the volume uh is about uh, 400 microliter to 800 microliter depending on the sample mostly the viscosity um and that times the concentration remember the lowest is 0 0.0 mix per mil give you the minimum uh, sample needed to get a set of repl uh, triplicates. Here, let's move to our, uh, as you see, uh, the magician's table. Since it's a magic table, the sample has been magically loaded into the plate. Now, what we need to do is just to put a plate into the carrier and you don't have to worry about the orientation. I know sometimes people uh, get nervous about it, um, but if you don't put in, uh, the right orientation is not going to fit. So, so put in the plate and then we're going to secure, or we're going to put a rubber 
gasket uh, because we're using lab grade inert gas to push uh, the liquid into the flow cell. Uh, we need uh, to give it a good seal and uh, then put the metal cover on top. And that's it. So for the 96 uh, well plate, so what you see here is a chiller to lower the temperature if you want uh, during the measurement. And again, you can put in the plate. Uh, so by the way, the rubber gasket, we have um, different options. There's one to uh, avoid uh, evaporations, again, if you need to. If you really worry about evaporation, we have another gasket to do that. So yeah, so as simple as that, um, we assembled uh, the plate holder and now it's ready to be placed into the system. Um, so here in the system, we have an, an, a lining pin and yeah, by the way, this carrier has some weight. And then you will just um, secure this carrier. And then you can leave the door open or just close it. So that's pretty much all the sample prep. And this is the only thing that needs an extra person to do just to load the sample and to put it inside the instrument. Uh, so for 96 well plate, uh, sometimes it's um, confusing to load all the samples. So we have a really nice uh, sample loading guide to help you do that correctly. So this is the home screen of the software from, um, yeah, let's just go over from the left side. We have some uh, buttons for easy maintenance. Um, so this one might be uh, which you usually like look at. Um, so everything is good now. Uh, coming over to the home screen, uh, there's the, the middle row has some easy uh, sample testing button, but usually we will just build a protocol uh, using quick start. Uh, this protocol, we we're gonna dive into it, but now I'm just giving you an overview. And this protocol, logs uh, allows you to view the information about past protocol runs exactly as what is that in this bubble and what you're gonna spend most time on is this uh, data analysis uh, so actually this uh, software has an offline version you can do data analysis using an offline version uh, on your laptop and also settings so let's build a protocol first to start experiment. What I really like is this quick start. I'm a big fan. So let's just give it a name. I usually put AAA. And uh, you can include prime verify prime, prime, include all the good stuff. So here, protocol type, we have uh, three uh, typical types, same sample, same buffer, different sample, same buffer, different samples, uh, different buffers. Mm, and then for the plate type, so this one is what's in our newest second generation instrument Apollo. This BB is for a buffer buffer station, which uh, saves more uh, well pairs. So uh, let me just give it a name and suppose name. So once, yeah, it's gonna take a while, right? So now you can see the play view and you can just keep increasing uh, the number of samples and you can uh, change the buffers here. So yeah, because we're in same buffer, uh, this is only one. If you use different buffer, there's gonna be more. You can save this and add it in protocol or just this is good enough, let's just save and run. So that's the quick start, which I really like. And also you can come to this uh, protocol uh, tab. And here you can build a new protocol from scratch. You can import, export, and schedule. Yeah, you can schedule a protocol for, for example, time study or for maintenance. For example, we uh, do a wavelength calibration uh, every Monday morning before everybody comes to work and they will just do it on by itself on its own. And then here you can see uh, the estimate 
duration for the whole protocol. So for today, let's just use a pre-built protocol, uh, which we're gonna study, although it says of a common trip sim, but we're gonna study <laughs> lots of them in four different buffers. So here uh, you can see the estimate duration for each step, and then the plate view will help you load your sample. And yeah, this is 24 well plates for 96. We have a, a sample loading guide for you. So let's just imagine that eight hours has have passed and all the data has been collected. So let's come over to this data analysis uh, window. So once the data is analyzed, this is the window that you're gonna see. Um, so yeah, so there are a lot of tabs. Let's just go through them one by one. The first one is the absolute uh, spectrum, which uh, is when you interpolate all the raw data points into a spectrum. And what we also do here is to normalize the concentration. As you can see in this table here, we have the fit concentration. Yeah. By the way, MMS can quantify the real concentration of your biomolecule in, uh, in, in your sample uh, by, by fitting it. And here we have like a two mix per mil, 10, and it's normalized. So they are all kind of overlaid with each other. Uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's the absolute spectrum. And then the software will automatically take the second derivative of those curves um, to give you the characteristic peaks. So the x-axis is the wave number, y-axis is the second derivative. Um, and then we, we, we color-coded the ranges for beginners. You can also remove it and you can also customize uh, the range. Uh, so from left to right, the first one is the beta minus, which means intermolecular uh, beta sheet. So this means uh, structural irreversible aggregates. So when you have beta minus intermolecular beta sheets, the protein is unfolded. Basically, the molecules are holding hands with each other. So this is a great way to show structural irreversible aggregates, which is different from colloidal clusters. And it can be differentiated by measuring your size with your sizers and combined with MMS. So going after the beta minus is the turn region, alpha helix region, unordered, and beta. So this is your native beta, intramolecular beta sheet, and beta minus, intermolecular beta sheet again. So this is lysosome. Uh, that's why we're seeing a strong uh, alpha peak here. So here I have water, less of them in water, less of them in PBS, less of them in phosphate buffer, and less of them in tris. So if you zoom in, which you can do like this, you can see the replicates, which are especially this one, super overlay with each other. And if you just double click, it will just go back to its normal view. So that's the second derivative. Um, and then from second derivative, uh, what we can do is first um, flip the curves and then uh, give it a baseline correction. And now what we have is what we call the similarity plot. So from here, you can quantify the overall structural similarities using AO means area of overlap. Basically, the area beneath the curve, we use that to quantify the overall structural similarity or differences. And um, yeah, by the way, you can, in the setting, allow that to average the replicate and calculate error bars. But here I'm just showing the replicate. Um, so here, uh, you can see the similarity AO uh, result. So because we're checking, so the water, the three replicates of the water uh, are checked. So everything is compared to the average of this three replicates of water. So 
water compared to the average of the water is basically the repeatability. And you see here with only like two mix per meal, we get repeatability of 99.5%. So this really allows you to see very subtle structural uh, changes uh, in the sample. And compared to water, so PBS, so lysis, I mean PBS compared to water, uh, the similarity is around 95, 96%. And in phosphate buffer, it dropped to 94%. And then in trace buffer is the most uh, difference, has the most difference uh, from uh, the lysis, I mean water, which drops to 93%. So looking at the characteristic peak, we noticed that um, the alpha, Helix uh, is has the strongest peak uh, in TRIS, which agrees uh, with what's recommended because we recommend um, to have uh, to dissolve lysosome in TRIS because uh, lysosome in TRIS is the most structured, has the most of a helix. So another way to quantify the overall structure um, similarity or differences is this WSD, which stands for uh, weighted spectral differences. Uh, to explain this, let me just uh, jump back to this second derivative. So basically, uh, a spectral difference means the difference between two curves at the same wave number, and it's weighted uh, more heavily when there's a peak and less heavily uh, when there's not a peak to minimize the noise. So here you can see like the replicates with the error bars and the result uh, is the same trend. And uh, you can see the numbers here in the table as well. Uh, so that's for this two methods are for overall structural structure uh, quantifications. So now what if we just want to look at the, the spectrum uh, at different wave numbers um, to see um, more uh, information. So the delta plot allows you to have a really nice visual of the differences. So here, because the delta compare is checked um, in this water sample, so all the water is within the dashed line. Um, and all the other curves are compared to the average of the water result. So yeah, so this is for you to visually see it. Uh, if you want to have some numbers, here is a stability uh, plot. Um, again, you can customize what uh, wave number you want to show here. Uh, so we're showing four colors for four uh, different uh, wave number. For example, this green one is uh, 6056 for um, alpha helix. And if you follow the green one here, uh, this is water and then PBS, positive buffer and trips. So let's uh, keep going to this HOS plot. So HOS stands for higher order structure. Uh, so this is a bar chart uh, of the percent contribution of each motif to the overall structure. So this is customizable as well. So here we're not showing the beta minus because um, we're not studying the aggregation, uh, but if you are doing aggregation type of study and you can show the beta minus chart as well. So here you can see the increase in alpha from water to trace and decrease in on ordered, meaning it's more ordered in trace buffer. So we went from the absolute spectrum to the second derivative and following the first row here, you can have the delta of the second derivative to give you a better visual of the differences. And then you can use the stability uh, plot to see uh, the, the trend and the numbers at each individual uh, wave number, like what, so whichever wave number that you want to see. And then uh, you can also from the second derivative plot, quantify the overall uh, structural similarities or differences using this uh, similarity plot. And we have area of overlap and weighted spectral difference um, method. And then you can give it 
Gaussian assignment to, to fit the curve, then uh, calculate the percent uh, contribution from each motive. So basically this study shows that um, MMS can detect and quantify subtle buffer-induced structural changes. This is previously very challenging to be experimentally quantified. So with this information, MMS can help you choose the best formulation to maintain the optimal structure. The result also demonstrates the importance of measuring proteins in the formulation of interest, since changing buffer, as you see here, or dilution will result in a structural change. Thank you.